database naming conventions is a topic that is very important to me because proper use of naming conventions can make my life much less frustrating. I want to make it clear that there are going to be a lot of opinions expressed in here and I can get quite passionate about those opinions. However, we're going to see some of the opinions that are expressed on the next slide are the most important. Consider this a guide to raising the issues that your organization needs to raise. You're not going to have consistency among databases, especially where they come from third parties, where there are legacy databases, but the consistency within databases is what is the most important. Also, I'm not recommending that you change anything pertaining to an existing application that works, that has other code built on top of it. I can imagine bizarre situations where someone might want to do that, but in general, I don't think it's a good idea. It's tempting to look at these recommendations and say they have things to do with how people name classes and other variables and things within other programming languages, and that is not what is intended here either. The overriding considerations are consistency and predictability. What we want to do is make it so that when you're typing things, you're not distracted. You're not using what we might call clock cycles that you shouldn't have to use while you're writing queries or writing other code. While nobody expects you to have things like schemas and table names and column names perfectly memorized, having good rules will reduce the requirement to reference schemas. By this I don't mean schema names, I mean schemas, the entire database design. Because this wastes time, it's distracting, and it's frustrating. Predictability is close to being the same thing as consistency, but we can't imagine naming schemes that are consistent but bizarre. And that occurs more on the server level, perhaps the database naming level. We also want to bear in the back of our mind that by default these column names will be used in reports and other automatic code generators, and it would be nice if they had to be as little aliasing as possible. Some of these rules may be in conflict. That is not a cause for great alarm. When you come to such a situation, just deal with it. And also, don't rationalize to avoid rules to do kind of what you wanted to do anyway. That we may see in examples of other videos when we're actually naming some items. If you look in SQL Server Management Studio, you see objects. You see databases, tables, views. All those things you see in SSMS are objects. These are my basic recommendations. Do not decorate table names. Decoration sometimes means put some kind of prefix on it or change the name. For tables, I just give it a name. Customer, not table customer. An important rule, one which I'll beat on consistently in other videos, is that table names should all be singular or all plural, and I prefer singular. This is the thing that distracts me the most when I am writing code. I write a query, it doesn't work, and that's because some of the things in the database were singular, some of the tables were plural. I find this the most frustrating rule that should be enforced. I do decorate views, procedure, and function names. I put a V in front of something that's a view. So if it doesn't have it, it's a table. But if it's clearly a table-like object, then we know it's a table or a view by whether it starts with a V. Storage procedures, people have ideas all over the place. Really, it's not that important, so long as it's consistency and so long as they don't begin with SP underscore. I'll discuss that a little more later in this video. For functions, I generally start them with FN. Some people sometimes start with a U. Prefixes are nice, and you will wind up remembering that SQL Server requires that they must have schema names before them when they are referenced. I prefer to use Pascal casing where each word is capitalized. This works out most nicely when viewing in reports. And a topic I'll be hitting on eventually is to create schemas. By this I mean schema names within the database. Schema as a whole may mean the entire database structure. Schemas are actually groups. They're kind of like namespaces, but for database objects. Use those to group objects together, and we'll discuss this some more in other videos. Object names, don't use spaces, don't use special characters. You'll be so much happier. Putting spaces requires that everything be 
contained within double quotes or brackets. Using special characters means that when you use this with other applications, you'll discover that they don't like special characters. Naming a column product number and using the pound sign instead of number is going to cause you no end of trouble and unhappiness later on. Just don't do it. Use Pascal casing. Use Pascal casing where each word begins with a capital letter. I'm going to strongly recommend not using Hungarian notation. That's where we put some kind of data type as a prefix to names. This was originated primarily in the C programming language, which did not enforce types. You could set all sorts of things together without making a compiler error. We much prefer compiler errors to runtime errors. And it was really needed for sanity in the C programming language. It started dragging over to other things where it wasn't as important. I think it's ugly. I think it makes for a requirement of aliasing everything that comes out of the database before it can be consumed by an application and meaningful to a user. Avoid abbreviations. We had abbreviations in order to make shorter column names. And this was imposed upon us by early 1970s and 80s hardware and software largely been removed. We might want to keep short names because we don't like queries that return long column names with a little bit of data. So if you do abbreviate, try dropping whole words, whole syllables, and not random arbitrary vowels. That whole arbitrary vowels thing will make everyone miserable. If two tables are going to be joined, those columns involved in the join should have the same name if possible. It is usually possible. Sometimes it isn't. Suppose you have a person table, you have a person ID, and that person has multiple roles with respect to a record. Perhaps sometimes as a creator, sometimes as a modifier, but usually it can be done. If two tables that may possibly be joined have columns with the same name, and it isn't used for a join, make the column names more specific, even though it may annoy you. For example, if we have a description, this is horrible column name. If it's in a category table, it should be a category description or a subcategory description. And we're going to see that that's because when we make a query that joins those tables, we can at least write a view that doesn't require that the column name be aliased. If it has two description columns, you're going to get an error right from the very beginning. And it's even going to be confusing, perhaps, in query view of Management Studio. Do not use names for columns that are keywords in T-SQL or in any language that might possibly be used with the database. And we know what those things are. Name being one of them. Date. Order is often a problem in databases because order is a keyword. Putting it in brackets doesn't always solve the problem with the compiler. Do not name things name or ID. I get in an argument with this with developers who want the unique identifier for an object to be ID all the time, no matter what the object is. And then we go ahead and we specify what kind of object in a field in another object. I have strong feelings about this, that nothing should ever be named ID. And I'll discuss that later in another video. Make these names like account name or account ID. Now here's something that you can do, but you have to be careful. If we have a category, we might say, well, column names should be category ID, category name. If you do this, you might say, well, you know, if I generate a report having category name, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The user wants to see category, perhaps. They know what a category is. Can I just name a column category without making a category name? I would say yes, but you must be absolutely confident that people do not make category without any qualifier telling you what it is. Mean category ID. Sometimes people will do it that way. Once people start leaving off ID in order to name things, you are going to be in naming hell. Now, here's an interesting question I have that came up for me while I was making another demonstration. And that was, suppose we have account number. That's what users call it. And it would be nice if my database mirrored that. But if that's the primary key, it's an integer, it's auto number, I am used to calling it account ID. This is one thing where I'm going to vote in favor of making it account ID to have consistency within the database. The aliases that are going to primarily appear will be labels within the application. 
I can see someone coming up with a different result. But if I have a database full of integer primary keys, auto numbers, uh, or identity columns, I would like them to all have the same naming scheme and let the developers handle their problem on their end. Now here I have an example that I have run across multiple times and this is just perhaps an indication mostly of how my mind works or doesn't work. I've been involved in projects with multi-tenant applications and what I'm saying here will not just apply to multi-tenant applications but it sticks out with the idea where I'm writing an application and an application will have multiple companies that use it however I must separate their data so very often in such an environment we call the customers of the IT providing company clients and their customers customers and so we have a table of client table of customer they have a client ID and customer ID now just because of my confusion in my mind every time I deal with that I have to translate client into who we deal with and customer into who the client deals with that takes mental effort if I am dealing with a project in a specific industry and my client is an insurance company I'm inclined to name that table insurance company and their customers as patients. Now that might be ugly because you might say, well, technically speaking, not every one of our clients are insurance companies. There's some other entity that has a lot in common with an insurance company. The people they deal with may not technically be patients, but that's what they are most of the time, and we understand that's what they are. I would rather have t things that reflect names that are helpful in dealing with these entities. I would name things insurance company and patient, you're entitled to do differently, but when you wind up making up names for groups of things that are used only in the database, when there are words in the real world that refer to them, I think you should reconsider your naming system. Now I have a name here, server names. I have worked in organizations where you could figuratively break your fingers typing server names, trying to remember them. The server names had special characters in them, they had abbreviations that were hard to remember, they were, had numbers that were meaningless to anybody except the person administering the network. Server names are generally set by managers, network engineers, and sometimes these people are control freaks. I understand why, but that's what they are. The people who do that typically aren't like me, who's going in a management studio and having to type over and over server names or put those things in connection strings. Now I'm going to make a suggestion that might seem silly, but I think if you consider it, your life will be much better and things will be much more memorable, even though this seems to violate some other rules. I think the name should be meaningless, but memorable. Suppose you're dealing with an exchange server all the time and that server's name is Shep. Once you know the exchange server's name is Shep, the fact that Shep doesn't necessarily mean anything about Exchange doesn't matter. You're using that all the time. You can remember, oh yeah, Shep, Exchange Server. I think that the name should be meaningless but memorable. I have been in organizations where they will do things like make domain names, car manufacturers, maybe European car manufacturers if they want to have some fun with that. The server names would be models made by that manufacturer and database names usually take care of themselves because they have some meaning. Now you might say that's hard to remember. I'm going to tell you that's a lot easier to remember than things that may logically be constructible by using some mental formula. But you have to do that over and over again. Where you have to type and use names that are just intelligent in somebody's scheme but nonsense for a frequent user, those things have the wrong name. Then go ahead and create some server and database organization charts that people can see that have IP addresses maybe. I believe following this formula will make life much, much easier for those organizations, even big organizations. Functions must include the schema name when you refer to them. Usually that's going to be DBO. We're going to see you later that giving schema names to functions is also helpful. Typically a function will start with FN or something else. Sometimes people use the letter U. I really don't care. Some consistency is nice. Trigger names do not mean much to me. I very seldom refer to trigger names except to enable them or disable them. But I have seen some people who have gone out of their way to make bad examples. 
In a Microsoft official curriculum course, I saw where they wrote some trigger names to refer to the triggering table and to the operation that was being performed on the table, and the others were referring to what the trigger did or the tables being modified by the trigger. This is an awful thing to do. The inconsistency is what is awful. I just really believe that should be strongly avoided, although ultimately I don't care as much about this as I do other things. Stored procedures, most of us know not to begin those with SP underscore because that means that when it's executed, the query optimizer and compiler looks for stored procedures in the master database before it looks for them in the current database. And that's true even if the stored procedure is fully qualified to refer to a database and schema. It turns out this rule for SP is valid for more than stored procedures. If you start a view with SP underscore, it's going to look in the master database first. It will find it if it exists in the correct data, but it has to make that extra search. Does it make that much difference? I haven't done any tests to see what the speed test is. You might think of SP as standing for special rather than stored procedure. We'll be looking at using schemas for stored procedures as well. If you like this video and you like more videos on this channel, please do the usual things that content producers request. Like, comment, share, subscribe. These help make the channel successful and promote it within YouTube searches.